All right. Good morning, everyone. How is everybody today? Hope everyone's okay out there. Um, quick note before we start, we just started adding some Spanish talks to Ocean Stories. We've had a few people uh, request it. Um, check out the calendar on the website and make sure to follow us on social media for the latest updates, but we'll be adding a few talks in Spanish coming up real soon. Um, I've just launched the poll too, and let's get started. So today we've got someone really special joining us, someone that's really close to my heart, really, really, really close friend of ours, um, Regina Domingo, the founder of Nakawe Project and Nakawe Experiences. She's going to talk to us a little bit about ecotourism and uh, uh, sustainability and these things. So Reggie, without further ado, take it over. I hand it over to you. No microphone. Can't hear you. Nope. We've got a mic issue. <laughs> well, that no. one's, there we go. Working. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us today and hopefully getting a little bit inspired. And actually, I love that we are having a little bit of free time and a break to actually use this time to do things that we normally don't have to, time to do. So I think that the, there is a positivity and there is a, an amazing uh, opportunity for all of us to share knowledge, to get inspired and creative, uh, hopefully to create a better world um, from this um, really hard moment that we are all living in this planet. So I'm gonna share with all of you my presentation and we are gonna start um, right now. So this is a sentence that I really want the people to read uh, carefully. And I think this is the reason that um, I do what I do. Um, most of the people out there are mostly in media to ask me, Reggie, how, how did you arrive where you are? Where, where did you study? What did you do to, to do whatever you're doing right now? And I always tell them, like, it's passion. It's all about passion. Uh, almost 10 years ago, I decided to devote my life to the ocean because of the experiences that it had provided me. Uh, good experiences and really like bad experiences and the deepest feelings I've ever had in my life. Um, so everything started back in 2009 when I saw this film. I was inspired by Rob Stewart to decide to, you know, to take a step out and do something. He inspired me to want to know more and understand what was going on in our oceans. And I end up in Cocos Island. I wanted to understand uh, different locations where Rob was talking that all these animals were being overfished and, and these places were threatened by, by illegal fishing. And it just inspired me to go out there and actually see it. So I actually, want to share with you that I really believe this is the only way to understand that our oceans need us more than ever. It's, it's right now the moment. And if you actually don't see it, it's very difficult to have this motivation and this passion to, to lead you to do things, right? So back in 2012, I decided to apply um, to be a volunteer in Cocos Island. And it was a hard and long journey because it's not that easy to apply to volunteering like this with uh, government and rangers and stuff like that. But I did it. Uh, it was almost a year trying to apply to go there and actually understand what was going on. And all these experiences taking long lines, uh, trying to protect a wall heritage site that it was supposed to be protected that it's supposed to be respected because it belongs to humanity, it belongs to the earth, and it has so many, you know, important resources, natural resources that we should be protecting. I understood that this was not happening, and I got frustrated. I never studied how to save the planet. I never studied science. I'm not a scientist, and this is another question that a lot of people ask me. I'm just a passionate, motivated person and I try to use all my skills to do whatever my heart tells me to do, right? So in that moment in Cocos Island, I got all this information by having experiences, but more than anything, I also got information and, and feedback from scientists and people that were out there 
in many different marine protected areas and around the world um, trying to you know achieve and and protect and achieve goals and and try to do something against this illegal fishing and the oceans were facing what i saw with my own eyes there were places where there's still uh, biodiversity was still thriving but they were threatened by overfishing and they were places that were not protected at all so scientists and, and people shared with me all this information only a three percent almost of our oceans are really like protected in papers but only i think almost two percent it's fully protected so how and what i could do in order you know to to have more people uh aware of what what's going on and and trying to inspire people to go out there and do something i decided that i I needed to use all my skills and I studied communications and tourism and being a blonde girl uh, helped me got access to many different places. I could not only understand overfishing and, you know, the devastation of sharks only going to Cocos Island, but I needed to go to many different countries. I've been in Panama, I've been in Costa Rica, I've been in Guatemala, I've been in South Africa, I've been in Cabo Verde, I've been in Fiji, in Tonga, I crossed the Atlantic, I crossed the Pacific South sailing. And then I decided to create a non-profit organization. Why I decided this? It's just like something that came to my heart. I wanted to create a tribe. I wanted to create, you know, this motivation and show the, the world what was going on out there. I needed that. I couldn't remain silent. I couldn't just you know, be sympathizing with the threat and then do not do anything about it. Nobody teach me how to do this. It was by myself going to different places around the world, trying to understand also the nature of the people there. If you actually don't try to understand what are the needs of those people, you cannot address an issue. It's not the same to address, you know, targeting a really specific species of migrate, highly migratory species of pelagic species of apex predator species in Panama than in Mexico. The cultures, the people, the needs of these places are, and, and, and in general of these communities are different. And then I started, um, I started to want to take out myself from Cocos Island because it was really my heart and all I wanted is to protect Cocos Island but I, I I saw with my own eyes that this was not happening only in Cocos Island this was happening all over the world this was happening in every single coastline and ocean where there are sharks and that's everywhere um after a long period of time and I'm talking about three four years of being in different countries in different communities with different fishermen i was super inspired by them in the beginning i i wanted to kill them all you know when i saw them in cocos island fishing illegally i wanted to i i, I couldn't stand them but with time i understood that they were not the problem they were just part of a, a spiral that it's happening out there everywhere um so then i started to create different projects and campaigns and lead a team that it's called nakawe project and it doesn't have a name or a brand it's a team of people that wants to actually do things and and help communities and understand more data about species and and do things and we started to go out with fishermen why we started to go out with fishermen because they are the ones that know the ocean better they know the ocean better than any scientist i've ever known they know the seasons, they know how to attract the species, and they know when is the right time to find them. So with all these experiences, different countries, and of course my love for the ocean, because the reason I do what I do is because I love nature more than anything else in this life. Um, and it's because it's what have, have created the regime that you see today. I grew up literally between dogs wolves going to you know mountains with my father because he was a sled dog racer and many people told me tell me how you end up in long laners in fishermen and it's all about the same it's nature that created the regime that i am today and because i am like this i need to give back to nature so i'm trying my best we are trying our best to understand what goes going on 
And of course, conservation, it's not always nice. It's not always, you know, um, it's not always swimming with sharks alive. It's not always swimming with sea turtles alive. It's about getting deep to the issue and to the cause to the chain of why and how this is happening. And it got me to very crazy moments and, and situations like the one you're seeing where that was a warehouse with five tons of different species of sharks where we were taking DNA samples. And again, I'm not a scientist, but I do work with scientists. You just need to have the passion and the power to get to, get to the right places, to get the right info and the right data, you know, to take out this pitch. And the speech is, yes, maybe I consider myself an activist because I'm trying to fight against something that is simply not right. It is not right that we are in a state where we empty our oceans in a way that they cannot uh, thrive for the future. And the future are, are people like us that have maybe four or five years old all over the world, seeing this world dying, and we have the opportunity to change that. How I got inspired to be where we are is because I understood that high seas are really difficult to control, are really difficult to, to protect, are really difficult to, pro, to patrol. Places like Cocos Island are even difficult, even they are created marine protected areas and then there are park rangers, it's, it's so difficult. So what I understood is that if we don't work in order to keep feeding the people because actually the oceans are providing, like you see in this screen, food for 3 billion people, we are not going to be, be able to fix it. Shark meat and other pelagic species that are endangered are being traded all over the world every day in front of our faces. You don't need to be in Mexico like I, like I am to be saving species. You can be anywhere go to your seafood section in the supermarket and check out what they are selling. We are not feeding humans or we are not using the resources in a sustainable way. And this is why we started to do a <coughs> project more um, directed to try to understand what was going on, for example, in Mexico. And this is a little bit of science and I know we want to hope and we want to enjoy, but I want you to understand that I'm not a scientist and I arrived to Mexico and my, my need was to understand what was going on. In order to understand what was going on, we analyzed different shark meat fillets and samples that were being sold all over Baja from north to south in different seasons. And what we understood that most of the species were endangered species. But more than that, that the average mercury that these species had was not even healthy for humans. All of this was done or was researched for the intention to get more protection for mako sharks. That 10 years ago, nobody was thinking that mako sharks would be in the state that they are today. And actually it's one of my favorite sharks, but mako sharks brought us to other species. And we understood being in Mexico that this was not happening only with sharks. And this is when it came the moment of understanding how we can make conservation sustainable. Because actually conservation is super hard. It's fun, but it takes you all the energy, all the creativity and all the money, sadly, that you probably have because it's not the best business plan ever. So from here, um, and I would love to, uh, to shout out these amazing photos from my uh, partner and friend, Atna Kawe, David Serrade, one of the co-founders of our nonprofit organization. We saw that this was happening with many different species and not only in Mexico, everywhere. So we wanted to create a new opportunity for all of us, as included, to make this more sustainable. Because what we like, right, is to share the ocean with people. We want the people to, get in, to fall in love like we did in order to protect it seeing the good and the bad. And then what we decided is as we are in one of the most incredible, beautiful places on earth for highly migratory species from mammals to sharks and mantas and sea turtles is to try to understand why tourism was only happening in two crucial spots, basically, like in high numbers, right? Our goal 
was actually to create an economic for different places, you know, an opportunity for different fishermen with new products. So we started to scout Baja in a deeper way. We wanted, you know, to understand more migrations, more species, and hopefully making the, the locals understanding that if they actually protect these resources, they can have a better life it's going to be less harder for them and it's going to be easier for them to thrive both nature and themselves so we came out with the idea of creating an arm of of our organization the sustainable part how we actually take people out there how we invite them because sometimes when you are at home and you are alone you think you cannot make it happen you think that you are not going to be able to create a project that how I'm going to start, right? So we want to give this opportunity to different people and we created the arm of Nakawa project as an organization for that people that wants to join something that it already started. And that of course it needs so many different skills that you probably have. So for us, the ecotourism started to be, you know, this idea of we can do it in many different ways. There's not only one type of ecotourism, there's different options out there that we can try to implement and use and study in a way that can be applied in different communities, in different seasons, for different people, and for different fishermen, because they actually the fixers that take our, us out to different places and natural events where we can try to use this in a, of course, responsible way to create an income that it comes from a green or a blue economy. So basically what we are trying to do right now and what we have been doing the last two years is to try to analyze all these options that we have in Baja California Sur or Baja California in general. And hopefully using this model in the future for more people to use this, this you know, um, process to try to understand how we can make conservation sustainable. So as you see, there's many different types of ecotourism and we decided to go straight forward to save at least or try to protect four species. And it's because it's the ones that we've seen that they have more threats and that they have not that much attention as we want. And we want to make conservation cool. We want to invite everyone. We want the people and the humans to see these species alive, of course, and interact with them and be mesmerized by them. But on the other hand, we want people to understand these species are facing a threat. And if we don't like start fixing this right now, it's going to be late. It's going to be, it's going to be impossible to go back and recover everything we did so far to our oceans, because these stocks, these animals are, are not for granted. They have a limit of pressure that you can, uh, that you can put through these populations, right? Like if you actually taking animals faster than they can reproduce, what it's gonna happen is they will just vanish. And no law, no paper, no document, no money will take or bring them back. So what I'm trying to, to say here is that probably if you are close to the ocean or if you wanna travel in a place that is close to the ocean, always consider how to actually help all these people out there that it's living out of the ocean to live out of the ocean more sustainable. And it's going from whales to marlins to different species that actually are lessons, like nature lessons you can put in front of you and will inspire you every day to go forward and to try to understand better and to see that actually everything's connected. It's not about sharks. And this is one lesson that all this journey uh, have given me. Like, it's not about sharks. Marlins, mobulas, sea turtles, most of the species are facing right now an overfishing and bad management of this resource. And this is happening all over the world. The reason probably is because we didn't think this could be a moment where we will be emptying our oceans. And I think that it's already too late. But until the last fish is gonna be in the water, we should keep working. We should keep trying to inspire each other and trying to find more ideas on how to actually make this happen. 
So, for example, there's different areas around the world, you know, with sea turtles or with orcas or coyotes or whales, how we can make all these species um, call people. And I think that the way that we can make these species call people is showing them also their threats. Um, the idea is also to try to educate the locals because if we don't educate the base, we don't start from coastline where all these species come to feed, reproduce, you know, and having their different cycles of life. If we don't educate these ones, these characters, these decision makers of the ocean that are in coastline, we are not going to be able to change the, the, the future and the, and, the, and the status of many, many different species. It's them that they need to understand that they have one of the most valuable resource on Earth, that it's an ocean that is still alive and full of biodiversity and highly migratory species. So from orcas to whales, to mantas, to mobulas, all of them inspire me personally every day. And I'm taking the talk to more a personal way because it's how I would love to share my experience with people. I, was, I, I didn't fall like in love with sharks when I was a child. I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't born loving these animals. It was a matter of one film taking me to explore one place and this place taking me understanding what was happening with sharks and then knowing and meeting all these beautiful species out there. My goal or our goal is to create the intention and the desire of more people and more private entrepreneurs doing conservation. But the only way we are going to make this happen is protecting the natural resources as the, you know, like as our core mission. Like if we don't protect this, People, it's not, like, if we don't understand that this is our, like, power, we are not going to make anything happen. Um, I have a lot of, like, personal stories that also keep me sane. And orcas are one of them. Every time I have felt that I couldn't face anymore um, being far away from my family because actually working... Uh, in another country, it's um, saying no to a lot of things in your life, your old friends, your family, your country, your culture. Every time I had a low moment, orcas appear to keep me sane and to tell me, keep on. And I really want everyone, everyone out there to believe we all have a connection with nature, that it's beyond what we have been you know, taught or, or said in the school or in our houses. But you actually need to be open to experience all of these things and to have this motivation of, I want to learn more about species. I want to learn more about why our oceans create, you know, moments like this when you can have a bait ball and marlins feeding in front of you. And you actually will understand that the ocean is completely created perfectly to work out without us taking these resources in the in the speed and rate that we are doing. So I want you to consider one thing. The first, the first time I've seen a bait ball, I was, I was taken back to a Disney uh, scene of a film and I was sharing with this, this thought with some friends last three weeks ago in, in, shark, in shark Water Boat. It reminds me, La Bella y la Bestia, the beast and the beauty, you know, like all this food and dinner happening and, and, and music happening. And this is how I motivate myself every single time I can be in the water with a live species and making these connections also with, you know, songs, Disney films, you know, it's out there for us to get creative and to get inspired. But more than anything, it's out there for you to take the opportunity of immerse yourself in nature. If you don't go out there and you let nature teach you lessons, you are not going to be in, inspired enough to have this passion and, 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 and thrive you know, in projects or, or, or make projects and conservation happen. You need to be in contact with the good and the bad, and you need to immerse yourself in the ocean as the ocean it is right now. And it's not always good. Um, we, I'm going to show you different photos about 
biodiversity, but more than anything, I want to show you this photo. This is one of the most amazing, beautiful moments I've ever had in Baja. And it was the time when we actually um, went through a process with the fisherman to change him into, into ecotourism. And you can see our faces here. It, there's David and myself and the fisherman, super happy because we attract one shark. It was a mako. And this mako has been with us for a while. And then the fisherman was like, oh, it's easier to attract them and not to kill them than actually needing to kill a mako shark. So this keeps motivating us. It's not only Victor, that is the fisherman that you see in this photo. It's about a lot of fishermen out there that want this opportunity. But without us, they cannot do this change. They cannot see all these opportunities out there, like the dolphins, the turtles, the orcas, the sharks, the marlins. They, they don't have this like, mindset of you know, creating, in a way, products, marketing. They don't even talk English. So our goal is to motivate more people, of course, to come to these experiences and help us understanding better the status of different species, the threats, and, and of course, having the amazing experience of ecotourism that means to use the resource in a non-extractive way, in a way that this, can, this species can thrive, but more than this, that also community can thrive with them, thriving, right? right? So, why I want you to understand that ecotourism is amazing. Ecotourism can give a lot of inputs to all of us, but more than anything, they can give, you know, data to science. Every single boat that goes out there to take a photo and to have an experience uh, shouldn't be only be doing only for, you know, because it's fun. Every single boat and every single person that is out in the ocean, anywhere in the planet, can be taking data. It's so important to try to understand what's going on. Then it offers alternative jobs to locals or to people that didn't have this idea, couldn't have this access. And that's super important because it's actually where everything will change from. And then educated them, educating them. If we don't educate them, we are not changing the base. So there's a lot of benefits and I've seen them happening. And I think that there's missing like a hundred more benefits. But for me or for us, these would be the most important ones. Um, and you can read through them, but it ensures the ecological sustainability of wildlife population. And that's a fact. We've seen this in other places. We've seen in other, this in other examples. Why we don't create all these little areas that are protected by, you know, little tiny business that provide opportunities to locals. And then they protect a concrete place and, and populations of species. It preserves the habitats because if we have the species, but we don't have the habitats, then why we are doing this for, right? It provides the, the, renov the revenue that can be used for scientific research. Research and conservation is super expensive and it's difficult. So if we all get together and use all these events and information to help other scientists, maybe we can arrive earlier to save uh, some species or to fix some you know, unsustainable uh, activities that are happening out there. Um, we already talked about the job opportunities, but it creates an alternative livelihood for fishermen, and that's super important. We need that. It's not that we need to ask them to stop fishing, and I actually had a bad moment this moment, uh, that bad moment this morning in my Instagram of someone telling me, go vegan. We are all animals. We shouldn't go radical and be imperative with people. We can recommend. Being vegan, it's not doable in every place. And we don't want to tell fishermen to stop fishing. We want fishermen to keep fishing in a sustainable way. And more than anything, understanding which species are not sustainable anymore. But it's not everything black and white because there's actually a lot of places where veganism cannot happen. And I believe that Baja, it's a very difficult place to make it happen. That was just a, a little input. It generates additional revenue for governments and that's super important. We need governments to believe conservation can happen and only showing them that it's sustainable and it has a revenue, it will happen. It, stimula it stimulates the development of a, of a region and be careful with this. 
I'm, or we are not trying to, you know, explode pristine and remote areas. We are just trying to understand why tourism sometimes it's only put and focus in one place instead of analyzing more remote places with maybe high end opportunities of tourism, less people, more revenue, and being able to understand what's going on with different species and places. Um, and then it was uh, environmental awareness through education experience. I've seen, I have been with humans in our experiences that after being with us, stop eating tuna, for example. It, that's, that's, that's a, you know, like that's a change because actually tuna fisheries promote shark fisheries. So how cool is to share a week with someone that after three months, it's going to contact you and tell you, oh, because of you, I stopped being eating, I, I stopped eating tuna. That's amazing. And then it enables people to encounter, admire, respect, and appreciate marine wildlife. And this seems like just empty words, right? No, that's one of the most important points for me. When you get people to learn about a species in front of them, they are able to, to fill it and to connect it in a way that probably they are gonna respect this species more. And species like Marlin, that for me, they don't have the attention that they should have because they are beautiful, they are unique, they are crucial in our oceans. And I've been living for many, many years in a country that eats a lot of teal fish, that it's Spain. I think that taking them swimming with the marlins, it's changing the life of many different humans we had this last season with the marlins. It enforced conservation initiatives. And this is a very important point for me. Conservation is not, it's not the, it shouldn't have like only one voice. It should have all of our voices. And I just hope that you can rethink on this COVID time that we have to take a break and to think about our boys. What are, our, what are your skills, your best skills? Is, is your, your skill, I don't know, to film, to photograph, to communicate, to write, to, to teach? To, what is your skill? And use it. Because I still remember when I asked Rob Stewart, because I end up meeting one of my heroes. I end up working with him. I still remember when I asked him, what can I do to really make a difference? And Robbie told me, Reggie, your voice is unique. Just keep doing what you're doing and we will make this happen together. Don't forget that. So here's then, so many years after living in Mexico, after being living in so many different places around the world where the threat is the same, but the nature of the threat is different. Trying to understand how can I use my voice to get more people like you coming to places like this to learn about the beauty and the bad. So I just want to remember this person. And for me, it's very important that all of you take this time also to see Sharkwater Extinction or Sharkwater, his documentary. For me, Rob Stewart, it's one of the reasons that I am where I am today. And this is why I believe that my voice can be replicated, you know, through this mouth for what Rob taught me or, or teach me and still teaching me because I can find his energy out in the ocean every day for you to do something about it. So I don't know if this was fast because I'm not even tracking my timing, but of course, now I think the most important and the most beautiful thing is to interact with all of you. And if you have questions, I know we went super fast through this because it's a lot of content to talk about. But I hope that I inspire you to do something. I believe in dreams. I believe in plans. And this is what we're actually doing. And I'm not doing this alone. I want really, really, really to thank Jay uh, and Dive Ninjas and all the people that is involved in creating these ocean stories for us to be able to communicate through these social distancing times. Um, but actually people like Jay make me believe every day that dreams and plans are, are, are able to happen. So think about it, you know, uh, get inspired, get creative, and just join people like us because we exist. And even if social distancing is happening right now, we are open to use this time 
to think about more ideas, to think about more plans, and to get a tribe together of ninja warriors all over the world <laughs> doing things. So. Awesome. So thank you so much, Reggie. Thank you, thank you. This is a really inspiring presentation this morning. Thank you. Let's, yeah, uh, yeah. guys, if you want to ask some questions, you can click the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen, and then uh, we'll read out the questions for Reggie to answer. So let's start off. We've already got a few jumping in. Lindsay asks, sorry, Lindsay says, great presentation and project. Thank you for sharing it. How do you educate fishermen as they change their livelihood to make sure that they're doing safe ecotourism practices? Okay, first of all, what, how we like educate them is actually making it happen. So we go out there, we do different, like let's call them exploratory trips where we show them the basics of a responsible and, and, and secure platform for taking out you know, humans in order to interact with natural events, pelagic species and so on. So actually trying it and, and showing them how the whole process works from, you know, using a satellite phone, having the right gear and equipment for, for emergencies, how to introduce people into the water, like showing them directly and failing sometimes. We don't know everything about the open ocean and they do know a lot, but they don't know how to, you know, put this information together with the sustainable and, and, and safety way of putting humans in the water. If you're talking about only ecotourism, the way to do it is to try it, to try, to fail, to try again, to fail again. And it's like with time, you can see that they are learning things that they didn't know. And we are also learning things that we didn't know. In fact, right now, we are going to have uh, in some days a uh, meeting to actually create a management plan for the marlin activity because it's something that it's never done before. And this is going to be done by different people out there, different organizations, scientists, biologists, uh, tour operations, etc. because of the experience that we have in the previous years. So this is how we do it, making it happen. Awesome. So Ro asks, do you encounter a lot of resistance when going out and trying to show locals that it's better for everyone to fish in a sustainable way or not killing sharks? How do they usually react to such a suggestion to completely change their lifestyle or what are they used to? Not every single fisherman I met out there want to change because first of all, a fisherman is a very independent uh, worker or let's call it like very independent human that only depends on their own schedule. So for them, for some of them, the idea to have a, you know, a timetable, to have responsibilities towards someone or things like this, they are not willing to also like old people are less open to change their lifestyle, right? Young people and medium age from, I will say from the forties to the sixties, they're still open. They see, they see the revenue, you know, we go out with them, we take groups or we just go out for research and they see how easy is their day for them being with us as a fixer, as the local expert and not needing to be 50 miles far away for 18 hours to bring eight or nine sharks back and then needing to clean them, you know, like the, the shark itself, taking out the, 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 you know, the stomachs and then cutting the fins and then, so it's actually, it's not everyone that is willing uh, to do this. We don't need any, everyone. We still need fishmen out there because in order to attract sharks, we also use fish, uh, sometimes like carcasses and we don't feed them, but we attract them the same way that fishermen do. So for a lot of them, it's a business plan that works for the whole community and they are cool with it. Like they are like, okay, some of us are going to go take, uh, you know, like trips with these people and explore with these people, but some of them can keep doing what they're doing. We are not asking all of them to change, but the main, I think that the main nature of the, if they want to change or not is age. I believe in, in, in this, like really old school guys are not that easy to convince, but mid age, it's really easy to convince. And I've seen very positive attitude. Awesome. I think that's part of it too, is that people don't realize is it's a, it's a community effort. It's not like you're trying, we're trying to change 
everyone at once is just getting the foothold in and you know seeing how the different parts of the community can help on different parts of that project and maybe they're not maybe some are going to make a full change others are be a little bit uh, helpful or maybe a little bit of change or they're still doing what they do but it, it's how it intertwines into that community and begins to build bigger and bigger exactly awesome I'm so laura asks what can we do from home in this period to help out Oh, Laura, I love this question because it's actually something I forgot in the presentation. <laughs> Laura, I need to tell you, and not only Laura, everyone here, that there's so many things you can do. First of all, I would want to encourage yourself that if you're still going to the supermarket through these COVID times, check in your seafood section. Check and report stuff that you are not sure if it's right or wrong. Sometimes it's hard for us to say, I don't know if this is legal. I don't know if this is illegal. Well, guess what? This is why we exist. Report us stuff. If you see shark meat, if you see marlin, if you see whatever you are, you can go check this. But more than that, for example, a part of what I already said, look documentaries like shark water, shark water extinction, you know, like get connected with this type of, you know, visuals that can inspire you. We have a petition running that you can help us move, that it's asking supermarkets all over the world to stop selling endangered and threatened species. If we, if we change the demand, if we change the supermarkets, we are gonna be able to change more fishermen because there are gonna be less demand this meat, probably, because it's, sometimes it's all about the meat. And of course the Finns have another trajectory and they're still being used, but it's about the meat most of all in many, many places. So if we go to supermarkets and ask them and propose them in a polite way, hey, stop doing this, you know? Maybe, maybe we will get faster to the point that we want, that it's hopefully having a shark-free world, that it, this was one, uh, one of the dreams of, of Rob. So right now, Shark fisheries are not sustainable or it's very difficult to make them sustainable. So go to the civic section, sign petitions, see what's documentaries, volunteer with us if you want. There's so many different things you can do. Uh, and there's other projects out there also that we can recommend for you depending on where you are. So use this time to analyze also how much time you have and what are your skills and then contact me and I'm, I'm sure you can do a lot of things from your home uh today thanks great so rob asks what is one of your proudest accomplishment accomplishments in this journey and why <laughs> that's a very hard question um the proudest is to still live the life that i dream living um i'm very proud of myself if i can say that in a way that it doesn't sound rude um i'm very proud of uh being out there every day. I think my biggest accomplish is to be in love with nature. So I just hope that I will never stop loving nature the way I do because I actually believe that this is when, when our world will end, when we will stop loving. So I hope I answer your question. <laughs> but in conservation, in conservation, okay, let's say one in conservation because I know that he's probably looking for one. I think that it was being part of this, uh, this last year big movement to include Mako Sharks on the appendix too. That was the longest project we've been, you know, involved like in, in science, in data with fishermen, ecotourism, like even a film that we created uh, together, uh, Steve Deneuve, um, that you can check online, a break for Mako. So it was not us that we made Makos implemented in the appendix too, but it was a group of people and we were included on this research and, and investigation and, and, and knowledge about what was going on with mako sharks. So I think that's one of the conservation, you know, more happy moments uh, in my life. Oh, incredible. So Lucy asks, uh, you mentioned how ecotourism has the power to create jobs for local people, but it seems often tourism brings in people from other parts of the world who are non-locals to take tourists um, uh, to take tourists on guides. How do you help reinforce that these jobs are created for locals? Okay, this is a, a very interesting question. Um, I would love to see more locals being guides, but in order to do this, we need to train them. Uh, very good in many different 
like perspective, let's call it like this. Uh, we always want to count with the locals as fixers, as captains, as the ones that are taking out in the boat or as the concrete expert knowledge of person of some migrations and places, areas and stuff like that. It's hard uh, to find fully only locals to guide the trips. It's, it's hard. We need, we need time to, try, to train them in English, in communication, in education, in free diving or diving, in rescue, etc., etc. Uh, I also love the idea of mixing cultures. Um, and of course, I think that it's a balance that will create the perfect formula for these places and future locations to thrive. Uh, I don't believe in only one culture. I'm, I'm Spanish and I don't even consider my, myself a Spanish anymore. I live in Mexico for the last four years and I would love to keep working here. Of course, if there's a moment that I can offer my position to someone else or that another guide can train another guide and then we create a Mexican guide, that's going to be out there. But I don't think it's bad to have different uh, nationalities in communities because actually I think that this informs, informs knowledge. But in order to have more locals working for ecotourism, we need more help, we need more time, and we need a, we need a transition that it needs to happen. That's a, a reality. If we don't train these people, there's like remote locations where they are never going to get the knowledge they need to run safety and and successful conservation and ecotourism projects. No, I completely agree. And I think part of it too, like going back to what we were saying in the last one, is that like what people don't realize, it's not just guides. There is a ton of working parts that go into these projects. I mean, for instance, our Marlin project with uh, Nakawa and Reggie and everything like that, you've got local hotels, local restaurants, local cooks, local, you know, uh, captains, is so many other parts besides just guides that are actually built into these projects. Um, and the idea is to try and make them as sustainable within the own community as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have to bring like with like, certain things like guides are like just are quite difficult to work out and they need time to actually train them and get better as Reggie was saying, but there's still, you're still also creating a lot of other jobs within these communities um, and everything like that. So it may not be, I mean, if you have one person that's foreign or something like that, because you can't fill that position from within this, uh, within the community, um, but you can start working to train someone to be able to do that in the next year or two years or something like that. But you're also creating 20 or 30 other jobs with that. You know, you mean it's a, a good balance and on a way to a, a good trajectory forward. Yeah, the important part of ecotourism is to um, remember that it's not only what's happening in the activity itself. It's all that it includes from the moment they travel to a country and how they get to a community, where they sleep, how they eat, etc. This is creating the revenue to a whole community. And this is what we're actually doing. We're working with hotels, we're creating camps, we're creating a museum right now that very, very soon all the people that has been in the Marlin project or the Marlin expeditions last year together with Dive Ninjas will be able to actually see a museum that also locals are going to be able to use to educate other communities, no? So it's not only the guiding job position that it's important. It's about analyzing how we can create more jobs positions and more needs towards ecotourism, right? Exactly, definitely true. Awesome. So Samir asks, is there a network of ecotourism organizations so when we travel around the world, we know we are working with responsible tour operators? Uh, I know like two organizations, but I think they are not updated enough uh, that I know that they were working with different people that it's super, super respectful with reefs. I don't remember green fins or something like this. But this is an interesting point, Jay, maybe yeah. to start a community or, a, you know, a page or a website where we can actually find all these people and actually maybe giving them, you know, analyzing if these operations are responsible and sustainable and then adding them into a, into a community. That's a very... That's a very smart question. I believe Pavi uh, has something or it was working with something. I heard that last year in the Inside East. I was talking with one of the Pavi um, board members and, and he was talking about doing something like this. I'm not sure 
how to answer what's the most updated version or, or platform. But it's a very interesting question that we should definitely go through in the future to, uh, to understand where we can find this. So. Yeah, and, I mean, to add on to that, there are a couple that have been coming out. For instance, Sea Shepherd has the Sea Shepherd Dive Program, which is a bunch of operators that have to meet a certain criteria um, in ecotourism and these kind of things to be able to attain that um, award or whatever. Uh, Empty the Tanks and the Rickoberry Dolphin Project, they just released a thing called Ally for Dolphins. Um, which are eco tour operators and vegan restaurants and vegetarian restaurants around the world um, that are basically, and hotels too, that are agreeing not to support dolphins in captivity in any way and are also doing other things that make them a good practice. Whether there's an actual network of um, organizations, like Reggie said, I don't think it really exists. I actually, I just finished writing an article this morning for Saving Earth Magazine. It'll come out next month, but part of the, the subject of the article is actually about this and how, you know, these days you can kind of throw eco tour onto pretty much any business and there's no accountability or anything like that. So it forces the consumer, you guys, um, to actually have to do a little bit more research and look into it and see like, you know, ask questions or see if it looks like something that is, they're really doing something good and not just kind of hiding behind this, you know, Thing of doing eco tours look that they're working you know doing research in the areas working on conservation projects these kind of things and all that helps out but i think like you said reggie it would be a good project a cool project to put together and build start to build this network or something like that you see so, new project this is, this is <laughs> why this this COVID time and this type of talks worth a lot like man thank you for this input and this is maybe something we can work in the future definitely it's amazing great. thank you samir so Ella, Ella says, hi, Reggie, it's Ella. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. I was wondering if you do Nakawe experiences where you can free dive with orcas. P.S. I miss you. Oh, Ella, I miss you too. I hope to see you very, very soon as soon as this social distancing with humans is happening. Um, we actually don't have any concrete program to swim or free dive with orcas. However, Remember, as I shared so many information out there in the media, that orcas, or most of the orcas that we see in Baja, come here to prey. They, they prey on different species like mobulas, sharks, tongues of whales. So, our experiences, of course, uh, start always telling to our guests what happened if we have an orca report because what we are doing is a chain of different people different characters out there fishermen captains you know different humans that report as the orcas why we want to see the orcas because actually they are an indicator of health they they bring us the attention on how they are feeding, where they are feeding, which species they are feeding. So actually coming to any of our experiences, you have the chance to swim with orcas because they are mostly every single month of the year in Baja feeding on different species. The most, um, the most lucky time or the time that you that we see more orcas and i believe it's because of the type of migration that is happening and why they are the the the, the species that they are feeding is in the mobula season because mobulas get closer to shore so we have more information from different places you know in different locations different communities different fishermen and then it's a very very good chance for you to see the orcas however it's not always recommended or we are not always going to jump into the water with them. Seeing the orca stop site is important. Taking photos of their fins to, to, you know, identify them because they are individuals and they are unique. And these spots and these families and these cultures are all different. And we have different type of orcas. It's important. So seeing orcas for us doesn't mean jumping into the water and interacting with them. We always need to understand how many of them they are, what are they doing, how they are behaving and only if conditions of the ocean meaning visibility you know waves wind current blah blah blah, allowed us to have a safe and respectful encounter with them underwater then we can try to make it happen what it cannot happen is to lose our minds and to want to see orca and break whatever natural event is happening because they need to fit and we can bother them so 
it's not always for granted that if we're going to see orcas, we will swim with them, but sometimes it happens. Awesome. So Sasha asks, do you know when Game Over Fishing will be um, released? Okay, Sasha, thank you for this question. Um, we are still in process, in production steps for Game Over Fishing that actually probably is not going to even be called Game Over Fishing anymore. Uh, it has been a long journey um, trying to get this film into the next level. We've been working the last year and a half with Andy Bayat, producer and director of Blue Planet and Planet Earth, and Jonathan Nir, a producer that is working with him in different projects. Um, so right now we are a little bit, to be very honest with you, we are a little bit stuck. Uh, coronavirus uh, didn't let us continue with the schedule of uh, reminding fi filming spots that we have uh, missing because as we wanted to take this film into the next level and next level means really good high quality um, film um, we don't know when it's going to be ended because we needed to go to China this year we needed to go to Cocos Island again we needed to go to different spots and actually the situation right now it's not letting us move forward however I hope to be able to to give you a right answer, I hope that in the next year, year and a half, it's going to be released. Um, it's going to be an international film, uh, mainly like distributed for television right now. This is what Andy and Jonathan have been working the last year. We got accepted <clears throat> and we got help from different broadcasters. We've been pitching the film in so many film festivals because um, we didn't, we, didn't thought, we didn't think to bring this film into that, that level, but then Andy and Jonathan believe in, it, in us and we change a little bit the production and the story even uh, of that um, core idea that we had like six years ago. But I hope that in 2020 first, uh, it's gonna be out there. I really have a personal need of taking this out. First of all, because of, uh, the current situation of the oceans and second because i want to move on and do my second film that i'm not gonna share yet about what it's gonna be about <laughs> all right so felipe uh says hola regina my name is felipe and i'm a big fan two questions one what is the tattoo on your arm and two can you talk a bit about using ambassador animals to protect an area or ecosystem for example the save the sharks or save the marlins or save the sardines <laughs> Hola Felipe, mm, mm, the big tattoo in, in my arm, it's an orca, um, it's not just an orca, it's the orca, uh, it's, a, it's an orca that I've been encountering in different locations and months and years around Baja California and the way she interacts with me it's a little bit special than, and different than the other orcas so she doesn't have a name, it's just Orca, the Orca, and she's a female, she's an adult female um, that I really fell in love with. So, and then the other question was like, how we can use the hashtags? I cannot read oh, No, it says, uh, can you talk about using ambassador animals to protect an area or ecosystem? For example, save the sharks or save the marlin or save the sardines, um, like picking one animal to say, to, to focus on, to be able to, work to protect that area, the entire area? Yes, I, I really believe is, is one of the, the, the smart things to do. Like for example, the Marlin, save the Marlin hashtag or save the Marlin project. Uh, it's not about saving the Marlins, but we need to make it cool, right? We wanted to save the mackerels, we want to save the sardines, we want to protect this whole area out there. But you always need to think about being creative and being like a little bit, you know, cool. So sadly, for most of the humans out there, a marlin probably is more sexy than a mackerel or a sardine. So I think that we can use these animals or like big elements or iconic species to save other species and to thrive to make thrive places like Baja California or Costa Rica or different places around the world. Maybe one species can, one species can have the attention that others can, and then one species help the other, like humans do. So yes, use all of the hashtags. All of them were to more alive, Felipe, <laughs> you know that. Awesome. 
So Fernanda asks, how do you approach fishermen or even family? I find myself having too much feelings when I want to explain and have a hard time finding the right words so I'm not perceived as crazy or annoying. Wait, what? Can I read these? Because... Yeah, if you click the Q&A box, it'll open them up. Oh, man. No, in your, uh, in Zoom. Okay, let's see. I can see. read it back to you if you want, no worries. Okay. How do you approach fishermen or even your family? I find myself having too many feelings that when I want to explain or have, um, I have a hard time trying <laughs> to find the right words, so I'm not perceived as crazy or annoying. Oh, wow. Sorry. Um, okay, my family. Some members of my family still eating tuna. And some friends of mine are still eating tuna and shrimps. And there's so many people out there that call me crazy. Go, go with it. You're not going to convince everyone. You don't want to convince everyone. And whoever that tries to let you down, you you just play this this game you just put your hands like this and you start singing la 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 because there's sometimes that there's people that it's impossible to dialogue with so just believe in you and keep doing what you're doing and and if they don't want to hear and like understand the words and the education or the knowledge that you are sharing don't lose your time because there's millions of other people and humans out there to educate and inspire. So just don't, don't stay in one world. If you can with one, go to the next one. Wow, ba, 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 ba. like this, you know, like a make a shark. Awesome. So a few people have asked um, how they can get involved in volunteering with the Nakawe Project or get involved with anything that you guys are doing. Cool, there's many different like, options to get involved. There's a lot of people asking us uh, on medias, how we do it. Okay, we have a, an online team. This online team can work remotely from anywhere and it can help in different things like campaigns, research of documents, creating you know, creative content, putting together uh, strategies for campaigns, medias, videos, uh, letters and stuff like that. So from anywhere from the world, you can join this online team where it has like different sectors that you, can I, like you can tell us where do you see yourself the most very very soon as soon as this COVID time it's uh it's gone and we can start uh like working in the camp that we are setting up in Baja California we are gonna be needing people in the field camp to be coordinators researchers and hopefully assistants for this camp where in this camp, the objective is to have a biological station, understanding different migrations, different species, working with the fishermen, working with the guests of our experiences, and so on. So you can, you will be able to apply for that as soon as we understand when the world is gonna be running again uh, in a more normal way. Then after, you can also uh, volunteer with us for a specific campaigns or projects that you can run wherever you are, meaning, we did the MAKO research in Mexico, for instance, right? But now this doesn't mean that MAKOs are protected. MAKOs are just regulated not now for the international trade. If you live, I don't know, in Spain, in Europe, or wherever you live, you can run your own campaign from your place and even research the same way we did. Now we are starting a new project in, in Spain with Blues. And it's the same goal as we did with MECOS. The goal is to be able to go to CITES and lobby the decision makers there to implement make eye blue sharks in the appendix too. So that, what does that mean? Let us know where you are and we will, and what do you want to do or what do you feel like doing? And we will tell you where do you feel better? But when, where do you feel better? But there's so many things you can do. And of course, as soon as you can, Travel to Baja California, join us in the field camp for the good, for the bad, and get inspired for the next, you know, like ecotourism trip that you can do with many other different people all over the world. Hopefully to keep this motivation happening and, and making ecotourism like one of the solutions for many, many places.
Very good. Also, guys, just so you know, Romain, who's a, another member of Nakawe Project, he just posted the volunteer email for Nakawe inside the chat. You can send them your Woo! CP and a little paragraph you about yourself and why you want to volunteer, and they can uh, get through you to them. So, thank you, Romain. Wow, how many questions, no? <laughs> I mean, I have all day, but uh, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm going to explore all the all the afternoon. So. I still have two hours or three uh, hours left. But we're going to wrap up in about 20 minutes. We'll wrap up. <gasps> so no. got to go through them quick. So the next question I got is from Shelby. She says, such a great presentation. My two young kids are watching with me and they want to know what they can do at such a young age to help make a difference and protect these species. Okay, let me go to the question. I want to read it. Where is it? Shelby. Shelby? Yeah. Why well, cannot see all the questions? I'm not sure. <laughs> so let me read it back to you so we okay. can. So such a great presentation. My Get two out. young kids are watching with me, and they want to know what they can do at such a young age to make a difference and help protect the spe these species. Okay, we have a special program for kids. We don't have that many ambassadors around the world, but we do have some, and they're objective needs to be change their school. They have the power to control and to go to the brains and the heart of all the students in their school. So we train them personally to do talks and to learn more about the status of different species. And then we call them game over fishing ambassadors. And they have, some of them have a hook like Ella, for example, have one. And they can do this in schools. They can use social media. Like Ella, for example, has been using a different way to approach more people because she's already like a famous conservationist. So using social media to inspire other kids and because their voice is unique, we need to promote them doing stuff. But the basic can be in the school or in a group of, I don't know, football group or dance group that they are involved or that they are actually doing. Try to do talks, we can teach them. We can, you know, like take like a, we can even use these COVID times to put different young kids and ambassadors together and, and do a training of maybe blue sharks that it's gonna be one of our biggest next projects in the next three years. But there's definitely a lot of ways of uh, making them involved. The only thing I want to be like very straightforward with is that I don't want them to be super blind in conservation and forgetting they need to pay attention also to school, to the basics, because this can happen. Like I've seen kids that go crazy and think only in conservation then. No, we also need them to learn the basics. So we need to limit the time that they should be in like working or investing in conservation in order for them to be able to grow in the, in the other you know, perspectives and sectors they need to grow in order to be a fully human. Awesome. So Marie asks, she says, thanks a million for this super passionate and inspiring presentation. Gracias. This is amazing how you work together with locals. We also know that a bigger threat to marine life is industrial fishing. Are there any particular projects that Macau is working on to tackle directly with the commercial fish or industrial fishing issue? No, um, the only thing we do every since and then is to analyze landings of big forts and long laners. We have access through different laboratories we work with to analyze random you know, bodies of sharks that are being landing in big ports from commercial uh, fishermen or boats. Uh, but we don't have any project directed, as I said, to high seas or commercial fisheries because we don't have the resources. And I really believe that it's super important to work in coastline. As I said, it's the place where species reproduce most of the time, sharks, movulas, like sea turtles. <laughs> so for me, it's super important to focus on one thing at a time. And as I learned my last, uh, I think nine years, uh, it's that I, I cannot accomplish a big project like working high seas and commercial fisheries, but I do can accomplish to change communities and locals. So for me, it has the same importance. In the high seas, we'll have adult species migrating, but they always will come coastline or shore uh, areas to do something in their life uh, 
in their life cycle. So no, directly no. The only thing that I can think about it is that when we collect data from different ports, such as we did for the Makos or in Costa Rica with Randal Arau, uh, some years ago for the silkies and the treasures, this is related with commercial fisheries because of course we need this data and the, the numbers of sharks being landed and the numbers of fins being exported to analyze you know the trait of this concrete species but directly protecting any high sea area or working directly in high seas with long laners or commercial vessels is still not happening yeah. and i think that that's the important part is there's there's so much to be done that i mean it's better to tackle piece by, uh, different organizations, different groups are working on different pieces and everything like that than trying to tackle everything at once and being able to do one thing right instead of doing 10,000 things halfway. You know what I mean? Or something exactly, like that. exactly. Make, it puts more change. Um, cool. So Juliet asks, when reporting on what fish we are purchasing, can we do a citizen, citizen science and report back? Where can we find, and also where can we find the petition to sign against the uh, shark consumption? Okay. I think the, the one was posted, the link to the petition, um, I think mm -hmm. Carrie already had posted into the chat. Um, let me copy it because it's sent to the panelists, but let me uh, paste it to everyone. And then the first part, the citizen science, uh, how they can get involved with reporting the fish they are purchasing. You can go for that, Reggie. Okay. Hold on, because I was trying to share the screen. I don't even know what you guys are seeing, but if I can fix this, just one moment. Why are always like the evening like times? Okay, in the website of Game or Fishing, you can find the link. Uh, if not, we will share it uh, soon. But in this in this website, Game or Fishing Nakawa Project .org, you can find the petition. Uh, and what was that, the other question? I get lost. No, that was the, they were asking when reporting on what fish we are purchasing. Can we do citizen science and report back? What do you mean report back? like report what they're finding like in the stores, uh, like fish markets and stores and these kind of things. Like you were talking about earlier, asking that when they're home, if they go okay. to the store and they see something that's not right. Let me explain you a little bit how, how does it work. And we can also share with you guys a video or we can post it to the Ad Nakawa so you can watch it. The way we do this is go to your local grocery store, uh, try to understand what's happening and how you do this is take a photo, they, that you need to write down the date where you are what are you seeing what do you think you are seeing or how it's labeled etc then report it to us and if we think that it's something that you, you can address we will send you a letter we have different versions in different languages and adapted for different type of stores or restaurants and stuff like that and then we will call yourself a reporter member we will give you the right to sign this letter with our stamp official stamp and then be able to provide this letter to whatever um, shop, restaurant, uh, supermarket that you want to approach and then approaching them in the most you know, polite and respectful way for them to understand that whatever they are doing is wrong. The way to collect the data, of course, if you are in a place that we can work with a uh, DNA sample testing or mercury testing, stuff like that, we will let you know. So you also can collect data like buying a piece of whatever you are seeing that you think that it's illegal or it's not right or whatever, then freezing it in your fridge. And then from here, we will, we will explain you the protocol on how to deliver this sample into hopefully a laboratory that can collaborate with us and let us know exactly what is happening. I hope I answered the question. Perfect. Uh, let's see. So Rachel asked, tourism can be destructive in other ways from noise pollution or increased ocean traffic or pollution, et cetera. How mm -hmm. do you make sure that snorkeling and tourism is done in a sustainable way? How do you make sure? Okay. So first of all, I think that this is a, this is a very important uh, point. Um, before setting up any activity or before setting up any public activity, uh, when you recognize that there's an area where a natural uh, event or animals or migration is happening. I believe it's, it's, it's required and it's a necessity to understand the nature of what's happening and to try and implement a maximum of impact in this uh, species. If there's a mammal, if there's, if there's a shark or, or sharks, like all the species are different and that 
uh, that requires uh, like a long term of analyzing the charge that these species can accept. How you do this is being there, as I said in the past, like the same that we do, how we train the, the locals to create activities or to be part of activities. It's to try and to try and to try and actually also like picking data and seeing how the interactions go, if something changed, different colors, different. Of course, if you're talking about engines, there's already regulations for different places around the world where they are already set up the type of engines that you can use if there's whales around and stuff like that. Of course, it's a very th thin line that if you cross it, it's like the solution, it's the problem. You know, like then there's no reason for us to do ecotourism if we are bothering the animals. Of course, we don't belong to the ocean. And most likely, most of the times that we are in the ocean, we kind of bother something, even if it's a you know a particular of of whatever like even a plankton you know but there's ways to do it more sustainable and of course it's less is more first of all less people that actually also the guide is able to control in the water that's crucial then secondary we want and we need to go and look for small operations big operations are and I don't think they are sustainable and I've seen that they are not responsible and I've seen they lose control. If we go smaller, we can go big projects, but the, the goal should be to be the less impactful in our oceans and for the activity that the species are doing. And actually how you understand this is trying, is trying to be out there in different days, in different you know, circumstances and seeing how they react. It's like when we create, uh, humans create a scene, right? Like you need to test. So in most of the cases, we will need to test. In other cases, we can read papers or experiences or other operations in other places around the world and use the models that they have been using if, if, if they are successful, right? So there's already information out there that we can use for a lot of different species. And there's information that we're still creating and we will keep creating in the consecutive years because there's species and natural events that still not, let's not use the word explode, but they are not used yet for, for an ecotourism product. So, it's a, it's a very interesting question. It's a very hard. It's very hard to to keep it um, tiny and to keep it low profile. This is how we want to see ecotourism happening. Yeah, and I think that's a, a big part of it. Is I mean, you look at you, we have to make decisions as operators to you know keep things small and hold that down and everything like that so that it's not affecting animals. You, you look at the Marlin project we have with, with Reggie and, um, you know, this year we've decided for the, well, last year we decided for this year now, the upcoming season that we changed the whole program around um, to make it better for the animals, less people in the water, less people on the boats, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, it's hard for us as an operator because to make these things work, you have to deal with in budgets and all that kind of stuff. And also keeping the community happy that you're working within to make sure that they're getting what they need and all that. Um, and part of that ends up coming with uh, maybe a higher price tag and having to, you know, balance it all out and everything like that. But sometimes, I mean, we look at things and we have to change the project as we're moving to make it better and better for the environment and better for the animals we're trying to protect. Yeah. Awesome. So Tom and uh, Samir both kind of asked the same question. They asked, how do you scale projects like this up to make them have a bigger impact? I don't know. <laughs> how do you scale this project quickly to make a bigger impact? I'm trying my best, or we are trying our best. Um, one of the goals is to have this film done. I think that if we can arrive to more humans, that will get bigger faster. Um, trying to get connected with everybody I know in this planet Earth. Like, I talk with artists, I talk with singers, I talk with businessmen, I try to get involved different characters from different, you know, um, places ar around the world to get bigger. It's, it's sadly not that easy. And there's thousands of millions of projects out there and there's a lot of threats out there. But how we are doing it, it's trying to, to go to international congresses, 
like international policy to get involved different you know characters like very powerful and 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 known persons uh trying to to create a lot of medias being out there every day with data and information and education it's how do you make it bigger i don't know i would love to know how you know how we can Im like involve people like steven Spielberg or, or like you know um i don't know even trump how we can get trump doing conservation um i think that the clue is also not to forget what we we cannot dream to change everyone and we cannot be everywhere. But if you have the right team for the right project and then we show results in, in, in a short period of time, then this will get, like, this will get more attention of governments and, and, and big businesses and, and stuff like that. Um, if anybody knows how to get more scale, please let me know. But I'm trying to do everything we can to, to get bigger, but yeah. it's not that easy. We we are a very tiny project, in fact. And I think too, like even on the, like one of the other questions was the same question, but on the ecotourism side. And I think it's like we were saying before too, is it's, it's, it's a, you don't want to scale it fast. You don't want this to roll out super quick. You need to make sure that like, that everything's going to work the way it's supposed to, and you're not going to end up doing harm to the environment or end up, you know, messing up or hurting the animals that you're trying to protect or the area you're trying to protect or the community you're trying to build. It needs to kind of be scaled at a, a slow but constant rate to make sure that everything is working correctly and you don't cause problems in the future. Um, one of the other things, like even like with us, one of the things we're about to launch, it's kind of a secret, I shouldn't really be talking about it, is we're building a new dive master programs and training programs that are actually built at looking how to build ecotourism projects to teach dive professionals how they can kind of do what we do with dive ninjas, but in their areas and different, take it to their home and build something like what we're doing and trying to train people to be able to take that knowledge and utilize what we've, what we've learned in other places and these kind of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, the scaling fast, I think is not the, it's not yeah. the question. And also, I mean, right now, I don't want to be everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. It's impossible for us. Like, yeah. We, I want to be able to focus in really concrete space, like places and areas and countries where I've seen that we can actually do something about it. I cannot think right now to be all over the world doing the same. It's, it's, not, it's, not, like, it's not a possibility. Like our lives are already too crazy having projects in Costa Rica, in Mexico and in Spain right now. So I think that it's better to achieve things in one place and again, show the results to others and, and share this knowledge and share the process and the strategy to make it work in other places. And of course, I would love to be everywhere, you know, but that's not doable. Like that's not, not, that's not possible. That's the reason I live in the places where I work for that long periods of time. I haven't been living in Spain for the last 10 years. You know, I left Spain and I'm probably never go back. There's so many places and species I want to learn from and, and save and protect, but we need to focus one thing at a time because also that was one of my, that was one of my errors in the beginning, thinking I want to save the planet. Um, you cannot start saving the planet. Save one species, one place, and then next and next and next and next. Exactly. One by one. So yeah. We're almost out of time today, guys, but let's go for one more question. And then if it's okay with you, Reggie, we can ask them if they have more questions to message Nakawe on social media or they can- I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Okay. Um, they could contact you guys can contact Nikali on social media or also you can respond to there's a post about Reggie on the Dive Ninjas Instagram. Um, ask questions in those places wherever it is and we'll make sure she gets them and gets back to you and everything like that. And if not, okay. we'll head up to La Paz and try to hunt her down and drag her out to answer questions. Um, Come to La Paz or to the, uh, to the desert. I will be somewhere exploring these days. Awesome. So last question I've got for today is from Natalie. She says, can we go on expeditions with you to be part of this action? Yes, yes. I don't know when, because the world is crazy right now and our freedom, like now we are in captivity, right? So as soon as these COVID crazy times are done or ended, hopefully soon, there's different seasons around the year 
mainly four that we are working on different experiences. I believe that the next one is going to be the Martins, to be very honest, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but how everything's looking right now, I don't think that mobile experience is going to be doable for anybody. Probably for me, yes, with the kayak, I'm going to go out there and try to understand how are the mobile uh, aggregations this year and if there's anybody fishing them, because this is happening in May, June and July. So I don't know how it's going to be the situation. But then after, straight after the mobile season uh, and the mobile project, we starting in October, Marlins. And the Marlins, it's not only about Marlins. There are sailfishes, mackerel, sardines, orcas sometimes, yeah. whales, etc. And it's the next expedition that together with Dive Ninjas and our Nakawa Ninjas team, you can join and learn about more uh, more about this area we're working. You probably will be able to see the CAM station that we are creating and learn about marlins, bait balls, you know, natural feeding aggregations, and of course, meeting other fishermen we work up there. So October, November, and part of December, if I'm not wrong, then December, January, and February, and part of March, we start We Are All Mammals, where we work with different types of mammals, such as whales, coyotes, dolphins, orcas, etc. And then this season, that it's what's happening right now, we were supposed to be working with sharks, with blues and mecos, but I mean, it's impossible. We cannot go out with boats. The fishermen are restricted not, uh, not to go out on like any research commercial or whatever activity is restricted right now so we do what we can i go out every day to different areas to check out but the next one i think it would be in october for the martins no. but yes you can join us yeah, and that's, the main, that's pretty much the whole point of what we're doing with dive ninjas what Naka, uh, reggie's doing with nakawa experiences and you mean the projects we work on together and the one separate is trying to get people out to see these things and witness them firsthand um and be able to you know get involved in citizen science and conservation firsthand and these kind of things um i've just pasted the uh, i threw the link in the chat for the nakawa ninjas uh striped marlin expeditions that start in october um so if anyone wants to check that out you can um I got to call it a day now. I'm sorry, guys. We're running out of time. I know we still got a bunch of questions left, but we're already out of time. So right. anyone else? We will answer all the questions. <laughs> Feel free to answer the put the questions on social media. Hit us up at, uh, at Dive Ninjas or at Macaway Project, um, and we'll gladly get back to you and everything like that. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and uh, we'll see you guys on Monday. We've got Pete Rodriguez from um, Paleos Kakuna who is going to be teaching us all about hammerheads on Monday. He's a hammerhead researcher currently working on research in the Eastern Pacific about hammerheads all the way from Galapagos all the way through Baja. Um, really cool work, and uh, it's going to teach us all about the hammers on Monday. So have a wonderful rest of your weekend, guys. We'll see you Monday. Thank you so much for coming by again, Reggie. Thank you very much. And, and thank uh, everyone for the time. And gracias, Jay, for this and all the team. Really, I really enjoyed that. I love talking. <laughs> I'm very bad putting it like short, but muchas gracias. Guys, use your talent, your skills, your passion go out there and do something as soon as COVID let us go out there. But meantime, stay tuned in our channels because I'm going out there every day to inspire you and to keep you sane and to give nature, to take nature closer to humans. So please, Stay in touch because I'm here to inspire and help you going through these hard times. And thank you, thank you so much for being here with us today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you for everybody tuning in today. And we'll see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend. Stay safe out there, ninjas. And we'll see you soon. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Peace. Adios. Ciao, pescados. <laughs>